Good morning. We are in week four of our series, Practical Atheist, and this is easily my favorite message out of all four. By far, this is the one I'm most excited about. If you've been following along with us on this series and you've been coming, you understand by Practical Atheist, we're talking about someone who believes in God, but lives as if he does not exist. They believe in God, but they live as if he doesn't exist. And in the first week, we talked about fearing God. Some people will believe in God, but they won't fear him. We actually had a little card we put together in a graphic and got that together for you. And that card is still available at the Welcome Center if you want one. And then the week number two, we talked about uh, lukewarm Christianity. I believe in God, but I don't want to go overboard. I definitely got a click in this microphone, don't I? We'll see if we can make it work. We talked about how lukewarm Christianity is not what we want to be. It repels those unbelievers around us, presses the life that's inside of us, and it repulses those uh, that, that love us the most, like God. And then last week, Anthony did an amazing job talking about the person who believes in God but trusts in money. Believes in God but trusts in money. Or the person that says, my security and my happiness is tied to my resources. My security and my happiness is tied to my income. It's tied to what I've got. You know, the man that walks out and he goes, man, I got my cell phone, got my keys, got my wallet. I can take on the world. Well, that's me sometimes. So if I'm not careful, I'll trust in that instead of trusting in God. Today, we're talking about knowing God, about knowing him. Seeing people that say they believe in God, but they don't know him. And he is knowable. He is knowable. And this relationship with God, not religion, but a relationship can be cultivated. The same way you cultivate the ground in the backyard so you can get tomatoes to come up. The same way you cultivate, if you're a salesperson, a relationship so that hopefully they'll be open to a sale in the future, that relationship can be cultivated because God is a person. Not a person such as you and I where we walk around with a little zip code and an address that we live at, but he's a person, meaning he has a personality. He has intellect. He has emotion. He has will. He made us in his image, the imago dei. We are the imago dei of God. We were made in his image. Jesus said this. He said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. We can know him. We can know him. We can know his voice so well that every other voice in our heart, in our mind, in our life is the voice of a stranger if we can pick his voice out. And what does it mean to know somebody? What does it mean to know somebody? There was a time in my life, a very sad time in my life, before I met Sarah Lehman. It was a very sad time in my life before I ever met Sarah. I was sad because I didn't know her. And then I, I noticed her. I didn't know her, but I noticed her. And then, and then I was attracted to her. I get to talk to her, but I was attracted to her. And then I, I talked to her because I made sure that accidentally, coincidentally, our paths crossed on the way between classes. Guys, you ever do that? Mm-hmm. I made sure that I went way out of my way and hurried. Oh, hey, yeah, how you doing? And then I, then I stalked her. I mean, I followed her. I didn't stalk her. I followed her on campus. And then I got to learn her, 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 her last name because I didn't know her last name. And then we started getting attracted to her. And then we started flirting. And then we started dating. And then we started serious dating. Some people would call it courting. And then we got married. And do you think that once you get married, you quit knowing them? That's, that's, the, that's the ultimate heights of knowing someone? No. I know her now so well, I know her better than she knows herself and vice versa because it's easier for her to, and me to deceive ourselves than it is to deceive each other. The hardest person to deceive in my life outside of God is my spouse. So I'm still learning and still growing and still knowing her. Are you attracted to God? Are you attracted? Or do you just maybe want something? You see, you, you're attracted and you go, I like what they've got to offer, so I want some of that. Are you flirting with him? Or would you say we're together? Are you cohabitating with him? Or are you sold out for a lifelong, monogamous, diving deeper daily relationship to know him and to know him more? At the beginning of this series, I challenge you, if you will be honest, Gut level, authentic, honest before God. It might be a little bit painful, but there's going to be some amazing growth. Amazing growth. Brian, we want to swap out mics. What do you want to do, man? All right, bring that other one here. And Steve, if you want to pass out bulletins, we're about ready to go there. We have a, a wardrobe malfunction, thankfully.
Check one, two, three. You want fries with that? <laughs> All right. All right. Levels of knowing God. Number one, I believe in God, but I don't know Him. I believe in God, but I don't know Him. A cultural Christian. You might say, my parents were Christians. I'm a Christian because I'm not a Muslim. I'm a Christian because I'm not an atheist. But you don't know God. Maybe it's Christmas and Easter. There's lots of scriptural references to people claiming to be followers of God. But they're not. They're not. The gospel, uh, the gospel writer John wrote in an epistle, he said this, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, I know God, but does not do what he commands is a, ooh, that's harsh liar. And the truth is not in him. I know God on one hand, but I live how I want. On the other hand, I believe in him, but my actions deny his existence. I'm lying to God, I'm lying to myself, and I'm deceiving myself. It's a head knowledge without heart knowledge. And some people are going to miss heaven because they chose to reject Jesus. Other people are going to miss heaven because they're going to miss heaven by 18 inches because they got God up here, but they never got him down there. 18 inches is not how you want to miss heaven. Some people, they don't just believe in God and, not, and uh, don't know him. They've served him. Served him and don't know him. Jesus says, I'm talking about the day of judgment. Can I get the click back on the PowerPoint, please? Thank you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles and in your name help park cars at Flag Church and work a slumber party and uh, uh, hand out bottles of water and uh, work in the kids' church and in the nursery? Didn't we do that? And then Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you knew you away from me you evildoers ouch ouch we can be aware of god but not in awe of him we can know information about him but not know him these people that were listening to matthew 7 they got defensive they start saying hey wait a second we did this we did this we did this we did this it's not about what we do what's already been done for us is christ on the cross it's about bearing fruit and knowing him not about gifts and results I've got some gifts and skills. You've got some gifts and skills. We can work those really good and maybe get some results. That's not what he's talking about. When is the last time your freedom in Christ, your freedom as an American, your freedom as an individual made in the image of God to do whatever you want, however you want, when's the last time you limited that because you know God? Not just you believe in Him. Because we've all had times we believed in God, but it didn't affect our behavior. But God, I know I shouldn't. And because I know you... I'm going to tell myself no. God, I know I shouldn't. And because I know you, I'm going to tell myself no. But if you don't know God, there's no reason to say no to yourself. If you don't know him, there's no reason to say no to yourself. Level one. Level two. I know him, but I don't know him well. I know him. I, I kind of know him. I sort of know him. I know him. Yeah, I, know, I, I pretty much know him. Pretty much know him. Let me get a show of hands here real quick. How many of you know who Paul Hewson is? Paul Hewson. Anybody? Okay. I, I kind of know Paul Hewson. I know Paul Hewson. Yeah, I know Paul Hewson. I, I kind of know him. I sort of, sort of know Paul Hewson. Sort of. In my late teens, I wanted to be Paul Hewson. I'd memorized his birthday. I knew what his birthday was. Are you talking about altruistic? He was theistic. He was a believer. His mom died when he was a teen. His dad died a couple years ago. He was raised in Ireland. He got into a band in high school with his friend Dave Evans. They made it kind of big. You might recognize their nicknames. Dave Evans' name is, uh, is uh, The Edge, and Paul Houston's name is Bono. Bono. It's a Latin translation. It's actually Bono Vox, which is a skewed translation of good voice. Good voice. And I wanted to be like him. I adopted his opinions as my own. I dressed like him. I gave him large portions of my finances and attention. I stood in line nine hours in zero degree weather to buy tickets to see Paul Houston, also known as Bono. And I actually had a conversation with him. Kind of. Sort of. It was March 25th, 1985. And I had a conversation, kind of, sort of, with Paul Houston, also known as Bono. After playing their biggest hit at the time, which was probably the name of the love, and that's the set list on March 25th, 1985, Bono looked at me and asked me if I played guitar. Up till now, every part of the story is true. And it's going to continue to be true because I froze. Because I didn't play guitar. I bought my guitar later that week. 
Instead of me, and I just learned the guy's name, Jim Foster went up on the platform and played guitar with Paul Hewson, Dave Evans, and everyone else in the band that I, that I knew they're all their birthdays too. So do I know Bono? Kinda, sorta. We had a conversation. We had a conversation. Hey, do you play guitar? That was my part of the conversation. <laughs> I don't know why he thought that. Maybe it's because I was air guitaring the entire concert. I don't know. So do I know Paul Hewson? Do I know Bono? Eh, do you know Jesus? Kinda. Sorta. Maybe you've invited him into your life a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, a marriage ago, and you enjoyed the relationship while it lasted. And you had some good conversations. You had some great memories. But he's not really the leading, driving force of your life anymore. But you still know bunches about Jesus. You know bunches about Jesus in the Bible. And you can still talk about Jesus in the Bible. You are absolutely informed. But maybe not transformed. Is the person that we're describing here, are they saved? Maybe. Probably. Kinda. Sorta. I'm not the final judge on that, and I'm thankful I'm not. But they're not making progress anymore. Paul the Apostle was talking to some people who started running and following after Christ wonderfully and then kind of hit a speed bump. He told them, hey, when you didn't know God, not just believe in Him, but know Him, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God. But now that you know God, or rather you're known by God, how is it you're turning back to those weak and miserable religious principles that are just going to enslave you all over again? Past six months, when you look in the spiritual mirror, how does your progress in knowing God look? Not your progress in church attendance. Not your progress in how many chapters you got checked off on your Bible reading. How does your progress know in just knowing Him? And what would it take to get that pedal moving again so your progress in knowing Him, not information about Him, but knowing Him to move forward again? Would it be, could it be, is it possible, kind of, sort of, that if the altar call was given this morning, not to repent of sin, but an altar invitation just to say, Lord, I want to know you more, that maybe that might get it started a little bit? Level three. You know Him intimately? and you serve Him wholeheartedly. You know Him intimately and serve Him wholeheartedly. And what does that look like? Well, that's kind of hard to describe sometimes. But He gets the first input on every decision. First input. There's an increasing awareness of His presence as you live and move and have your being. I, I live my life in full view of His vision. You know, when you're on camera, I mean, you're all sitting just fine, but if all of a sudden I put a camera up here and, and put it on you, Everyone's posture would immediately improve, wouldn't it? You, some of you would even smile. You'd look up from your phone. And you go, hi, ah, yeah, yeah. A man's ways, a woman's ways, a teen's ways are in full view of the Lord. He examines all his paths. Now, two options here. One, God's stalking me. This is creepy. I don't like it. But if you know him, if you know him, this is just a daily walk in life with Him as president and not just resident. And it's an invitation that you're not saying, okay, since you're God, I'll let you. It's a, God, will you please come walk with me? Every step I take today, every conversation I'm in, not because I want your help and I want you to do what I can't, but I just want to be with you. All day today, Lord. All day. I invite you, Lord into a constant conversation. I invite you into a constant conversation. Uh, this doesn't freak me out, God. It comforts me to know that you're there and that you're that close. I've tasted and seen that you're good and I'm not satisfied. I want more. I want more. I'm at peace, but I'm not at rest. I still want more. I know you, but I'm still pursuing and chasing more. My heart is alive because I know you, but I know, I know I have not arrived. I'm aware of my sin. Matter of fact, the closer I get with you and the more I walk with you, I'm more aware of my sin than I ever was, but I'm aware of my sin, but I'm also close to you at the same time. And this quote that I've shared before just rings true. So I can say that I am more wicked than I ever dared believe but I am more loved and accepted in Christ 
than I ever dared hope. Because I know Him. If all I did is, be- is believe in Him, I wouldn't be comfortable with that statement. It'd freak me out. But I know Him. How well do you know Him? How well do you know Him? Well, it depends. What do you call Him? Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. What you call someone reveals a lot about your knowledge of them. I mean, if my phone rang, and I picked up the phone and said, Hello, and the person said, Hello, Mr. Lemon? Mr. L- May I speak to a Mr. Lemon, please? A- a Ma- Lemon? And they butcher my name? They probably don't know me real well. They probably don't know me. If they call me Mr. Layman, they don't know me really well. If they call me uh, Pastor Layman, they don't know me real well. If they call me Pastor Mark, we probably have a relation. They probably know me. I don't know how well. If they call me Mark, they know me a whole lot better. If they'd known me for years and years and years, and we go way back, and they go, yo, Layman, goofball. Yeah, they know me good. They know me good. They know me really well. And I'm going to go right back. Yes, stupid, what's up? Why? There's a connection. But there's some people that know me at a whole different level. And one of them calls me dad. And someone that knows me really, really well can call me babe. And if you're a guy, don't call me that. It's creepy. (laughs) So what do you call God? We all know people who say, oh, oh, big man upstairs. Is that not an indication of how much they know him? It doesn't mean squat how much you know about him. Do you know him? If you know him, you're not calling him the big guy, the man upstairs. You might have had an encounter with him and you call him healer, lover of my soul, my affirmation, my redeemer, my, the strength of my heart the meditation on my mind, my Lord. Frequently, when I'm in conversation with God, I don't call him by any title because I feel like the conversation has never ended that I need to start it with a title. Hey, God, I don't know that sometimes I even need that because the conversation is ongoing because he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I'm his own. I was. Totally a practical atheist. In my teens, I called on God in crisis to relieve me of my guilt. Absolutely. And I gave God nothing but false and empty promises of religious action. That was me, totally. And then I was a level two as well. I knew him a bit. And I accepted him, and I started reading my Bible a little bit. Once in a while, I'd enter into worship and lift my hand in worship, you know? And maybe even sometimes get really bold and do the two-fisted salute. But then I started giving the Holy Spirit space in my life. And then I got challenged with Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul had tons of religious credentials. He starts listing them off in chapter 3. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was one of the top Pharisees. As to zeal, no one could top my zeal. I was amazing! All-star, all-pro! And then he says this, but whatever was to my profit, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything to be lost and the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Not just believing Him, knowing Him. And because of Him, I count everything but refuse, rubbish, dung, manure, fertilizer that you put in your garden. All the good stuff that I had, it's all worth nothing. Why? That I may know Him. Because I want to know Christ. Paul's not talking about some dumb doctrine of belief here. I want to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. But he says, there's one thing I do. I'm going to forget what was behind, and I'm going to press on toward the call that God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Is that your heartbeat today? Paul stands at the door. He's got all his religious trophies. And the door of the knowledge of Christ is right there, but he can't open the stinking door because his hands are full. What are you going to do? Dump the rubbish. And chase Christ. Brian, will you bring your team up, please? I am not who I used to be. And if you're not different, do you know him? Or do you just believe in him? So how do you do this, Pastor? What do you do? How, How do I get to know him? First thing is don't worry about it. Don't fret about how. Don't worry about the method. 
Don't worry about the details. Just seek him. How do I seek him? Should I be on one knee, two knees? Do I lift one hand? Do I do the two-handed salute? What do I do? Seek him. Just seek him. Open your heart. Open your mind. Open your Bible. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your senses. Open yourself to him. And we're going to give you that opportunity to do that in just a moment. You don't need seven steps. All you need is a heart that says, God, I want to know you more. And watch out, because he will show up if you'll just be open to him. If this series has been rattling your cage a little bit, and it's been getting you a little uncomfortable, let me tell you what the entire prayer has been the whole time, the same prayer that Paul wrote. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? There's a reason Paul wants you to have all that. That you may know him better. That you can know him better. Would you stand with me this morning? Come on, let's zero in on him right now. Let's focus in on him. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. There's not a single person in this room that can worship God for you. There's not a single person in this room that can seek God for you. There's not one person on the planet that can know God better for you. Besides, he's not wanting to hear my voice for you. He wants to hear your voice. He's not asking me to open my heart so you can know him better. He's asking you to open yours. We bless you, Lord.